ATI's Radeon X1600 XT was a largely underwhelming product on its release as performance wasn't anything to write home about compared to its competition and it came at a fairly high price too. However, one year later in October of 2006, ATI would refresh the card with one that was largely the same but at a lower than ever price. This card was the Radeon X1650 Pro. The card is using the RV535 GPU based on the venerable R500 architecture and features 12 pixel shaders, 5 vertex shaders, 4 TMUs as well as 4 ROPs, and comes clocked at 600MHz. For memory, we actually have a pretty decent amount for a card like this with 512MB of DDR2, which is clocked at 700MHz and is running on a 128-bit bus for 22GB per second of total memory bandwidth. The card sips power with a TDP of just 44 watts, and the AGP version requires one Molex connector for power. For a bit of background on the card, its story starts with the Radeon X1600 XT, a part launched alongside the rest of the X1000 series in October of 2005. Upon its release, it held its own against NVIDIA's 6600 GT but was priced closer to the 6800 GT, which performed much better. The card remained in limbo between NVIDIA's two competitors until the release of NVIDIA's 7600 series in early 2006, with the 7600 GS providing excellent value around the $150 range. This pretty much ended the X1600 XT's competitiveness as the 7600 GS won more often than it lost and was cheaper too. This brings us to around 6 months later with the release of the X1650 Pro. It boasted the same specs as the X1600 XT but was launched at just 99 USD. It's important to know that the X1650 Pro wasn't just a rebrand of the X1600 XT. The card featured a new RV535 GPU, which was largely the same as the X1600 XT's RV530, but featured a die shrink from 90 nanometers to 80. This allowed for the card to be produced for less than its predecessor and also lended it some improved overclocking qualities. With these improvements, you'd think it did very well against Nvidia's competition, right? Well, not really. The 7600 GS had fallen to around the same price by this point and they still performed very similarly to each other. This wouldn't have been as much of a problem, but unfortunately for ATI, and Nvidia's faster 7600 GT had gotten a lot cheaper by this point, and as a result, that card was pretty much the best buy in this price bracket. So we can tell that around its lifespan, the X1650 Pro spent a lot of time being overshadowed by Nvidia's offerings. Years later though, it's a bit of a different story. As seen in my Radeon X1900 XTX versus GeForce 7900 GTX video, the R500 cards generally age much better than Nvidia's competition due to numerous architectural advantages, particularly with them having dedicated scheduling hardware which would greatly aid with the more complex shader code found in later games. With history out of the way, let's have a quick look around the X1650 Pro. The card we're looking at today was obtained from an eBay auction for quite cheap, and it was in good physical condition when I got it but quite dirty. After a cleanup and some fresh thermal paste, the card looks pretty much brand new. The reference cooler definitely looks pretty odd with the strangely shaped clear shroud revealing some of the faux copper heatsink. The sticker is pretty nice though, showing ATI's mascot Ruby on a fiery backdrop. Definitely reminiscent of the X1800 and X1900 cards in that regard. Something I wanted to mention is that the X1650 Pro didn't natively support AGP, so how does this AGP card work? Well, it's all thanks to this small chip right here. This is the ATI Rialto bridge chip, and it allows the GPU to communicate over an AGP bus. Now oddly enough, the chip comes with absolutely no cooling from the factory even though it runs in excess of 80 degrees C. It's reported that a lot of these newer AGP cards die because of overheated bridge chips, so if you have one of these cards, you may want to address this issue as it could kill your card. What I did was stick a small aluminum heatsink on the chip to keep it much cooler. This will pretty much solve the issue, it's a very simple fix and I'm surprised it didn't come like this from the factory, especially on some of the more expensive AGP cards. Anyways, enough getting sidetracked, it's time to see how this card stacks up in some benchmarks. For the test system, I'll be using my old Sony VAIO and it has a press hot Pentium 4 clocked at 3GHz along with 3GB of DDR RAM clocked at 400MHz. For the software, I decided to stick with a good old Windows XP 32-bit and the latest driver available for the card, which is from early 2010. I also dug out my Samsung SyncMaster 1280x1024 display to keep things authentic. All footage was captured externally, so there's no hit to the performance that you'll see. That being said, let's now dig into some testing. The first game up is 2005 system killer, Fear. Here I use the built-in benchmark at 1024x768 with the medium settings and no AA. The X1650 Pro averaged 43 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 20. 
Frame times were okay as there were a few large swings in the frame rate, but this is normal during the built-in benchmark and isn't felt as badly in regular gameplay. Overall, I'm pretty impressed considering how punishing this game was on graphics cards of the time. The next game is good old Half-Life 2, and I used a driving section of the water hazard chapter of the game as it's consistent and demanding. I shot for some pretty high settings with 1280x1024 in the high preset with no AA, and here the card averaged 50 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 25. The game looked nice and played fairly smoothly, with a couple of large spikes in our frame times over 150 milliseconds. Now these were felt as slight stops, but they didn't get in the way of gameplay too much, and indoor sections of the game were totally fine. The addicting Star Wars Battlefront 2 is the next game up, and I benched a Conquest match on Yavin 4 with lots of action to maximize load on the card. With 1280x1024 in the medium preset, we averaged 42 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 26. Frame times were great and the game looked pretty nice as well. It's pretty evident that the 512MB of VRAM really helps the card out with these higher resolutions. For a little bit I kind of forgot I was making a video and poured an hour or two into this fun game. Need for Speed Most Wanted is up next, and I used 1280x1024 along with a mix of low and medium settings. The card averaged 53 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 28. The game looked great, but our frame times were just okay. There was quite a bit of micro stutter along with numerous spikes above 50 milliseconds, which could make for some jittery gameplay. It wasn't anything unplayable, but certainly noticeable. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory is the next game up, and I used Hardware OC's standalone benchmarking utility with 1024x768 in Shader Model 3.0 with no AA and no HDR. The card averaged 44 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 26. Overall, the game looked and played pretty good, with some slowdowns when using night vision, but all in all, it didn't hurt the experience too much. The next game is an older title, Freedom Fighters. I benched an outside section of the opening level with 1280x1024 with the high settings. The card achieved 70 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 30. Frame times were good, with some effect heavy sections causing a fair bit of slowdown, but even then frame rates very rarely dropped below 30 in my capture. Not bad considering we had the game fully cranked. The last game up is Far Cry 2, and I used the built-in benchmark along with some pretty modest settings of 1024x768 at the low preset. The card averaged just 23 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 14. Unfortunately, the X1650 Pro just couldn't yield playable results with this game. I tried a wide range of resolutions, but it didn't change much. I'm not too sure what was going on here. I guess the game just doesn't play nicely with this card, which is a shame, but I guess it was a bit of a stretch. Finally, we have Power Draw, and I used 3D Mark 3 and measured total system power consumption. Keep in mind these numbers were taken directly from the wall and do not factor in PSU efficiency. That being said, we can see the entire system consumes roughly 198 watts, which is over 35 watts higher than the GeForce 4 Ti4200 we tested in the last video, which was pretty interesting to see. I'm assuming that a bit more load was on the Pentium 4 in this test compared to 3D Mark 2001, which could be contributing to that fairly large increase. Well, it's pretty evident that the X1650 Pro wasn't exactly the most groundbreaking product in ATI's lineup at the time. Even so, it performed pretty well in the titles that we threw at it today, and should have been a pretty decent option if you wanted to get some budget gaming done in 2006. Again, 99 USD was quite cheap for this card considering the performance it was cranking out in games at the time. I would have tested newer games on the card, but I think I'll wait until I get a 7600 GS to see how that pans out. Another interesting point about this card is its upgrade potential for any of you AGP system owners out there. If you have an older AGP system that you want to do some mid-2000s gaming on, this card is a pretty great upgrade as it can be found pretty commonly on the used market and offers good performance as well. Back in the day, it certainly offered a large performance uplift over the Radeon 9200 that originally came with my Vio. Anyhow, that'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, 
and I'll see you all in the next one.